the, this webinar is called X-ray vision, examining comic book science and human factors design. And it will be presented by HSRC's Dr. Michael Klaman. We're glad you could join us today. Um, before we get started, I wanna mention just a few minor housekeeping details. Um, first of all, please make sure you stay muted throughout the call. Um, it's easier for us if you stay muted. Um, if you have any questions, you can enter them into the chat box at any time, but the, the questions will be fielded at the end of the webinar. And also this webinar will be recorded and will be made available. The recording will be made available at a later time, probably within a few weeks. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to um, Dr. Michael Klaman. Hey, thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, everybody, very much for uh, for coming to this webinar um, and taking some time out uh, out of your day. Uh, as the um, as the title suggests in the description online, I'm going to be talking about the intersection between uh, science and comic books today, and I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. So, for all of us, uh, when we think about comic books, you know, some of us are fans of, uh, of comic books. Some of us maybe haven't had a whole lot of experience. Maybe some of us have watched a few of the movies that have come out over the past uh, 10 years or so. But um, each one of us maybe has like a different, you know, favorite superhero or a different person we think of. You know, I think a lot of us, when we think about superheroes, one of the first people that comes to mind is this guy. Of course, you know, this is Superman. Uh, his powers are well known. He's invulnerable. He has x-ray vision and he can, uh, jump, uh, he can leap tall buildings in a single bound, which if you do the calculations, uh, that's about 141 miles per hour that he can leap straight up into the air. So there's, you know, of course, a variety of superpowers that these uh, different uh, folks have, not just, you know, super strength and the power of flight. You've also got the human torch who has the power to uh, set himself on fire and, uh, and fly and shoot fire out of his hands. You have Professor Charles Xavier, who is the leader of the, the comic book group, the X-Men, who can read people's thoughts and control minds. There's Storm, uh, another one of the X-Men, who has the power to, uh, to control the weather. And then there's Mystique, uh, who is a anti-hero who has the ability to assume the shape of any other, uh, of any other person. So we certainly know that you know all the comic books are the subject of fantasy, and we know that the things that they do are impossible. But that's not what I want to talk about. This is not about debunking. Uh, I leave that up to other experts, you know, like Neil deGrasse Tyson, who do that really well. What I want to talk about is, is the opposite. I want to talk about the idea of the possible through science with superheroes. So if there are scientific explanations or scientific uh, investigations that can go along with some of these superheroes, those are some of the topics that I want to talk about. And I'm going to talk about a lot of different areas of scientific inquiry to maybe inspire some of you who are entering some of these fields or know something about these fields, that these are certain areas that we might actually be able to, through additional research, to actually achieve some of these superpowers. So to uh, in an interesting little tidbit, uh, I'm not the only one who's interested in this. There is actually a scientific journal that's devoted to this topic. Uh, this uh, is published out of the uh, Technological University of Delft. Um, the first issue came out uh, about two years ago in 2018. And a new issue, uh, coincidentally, uh, the latest volume actually just came out this year, about a month ago, uh, just in time uh, for this presentation. And again, what they're doing here is they're exploring how we can use science to explain uh, certain parts of comic book uh, folklore. Uh, so it's called the Superhero Science and Technology Journal. Um, I encourage you, if uh, this is a topic that interests you, go out and look at some of the articles that they, that they put out. So, but so what I'm going to start with is uh, from uh, one of these uh, from one of these books on the topic. I'm going to start with a uh, with a topic just to get the ball rolling um, in, in a topic area that I'm sure most of you have thought about, and that is what do superheroes eat for breakfast? Now, before we jump into the superhero aspect of it, let's talk about what we mean and why this is important, uh, even with superheroes. So if any of you are athletes or know something about metabolism, you know, we know that food is our fuel. If we're going to exercise, if we're going to uh, perform anything, any kind of effort, we have to eat in order to get energy. So the average person, most of us are going to consume about 2,000 to 2,500 calories per day. Um, a pro athlete is going to need more than that uh, to fuel their muscles. So for pro athletes, we're talking about three to 4,000. 
Now this guy right here, who uh, today, uh, Pogachar, who uh, realizing, you know, we're in a pandemic, there was a Tour de France this year and uh, today was the winner. Somebody like uh, today, Padache, he is gonna take in 5,000 calories a day while he's in the Tour de France. And this is pretty much, he, if you're not seeing them on TV, there's a good chance that they're probably eating. So, you know, they have a, a breakfast of high energy foods, you know, bread, cereals, smoothies. Uh, certainly they're gonna have some coffee. While they're riding, they're gonna be snacking on, on, on bread and jelly toast, uh, energy bars, um, energy shots, caffeine shots. Um, and this is, they're pretty much gonna be doing this all day and they're gonna, gonna have a fairly large dinner which is gonna have a lot of protein and carbohydrates as well. So the idea basically being if you're riding 100 miles a day for three weeks straight, you're gonna need a lot of food to, uh, to fuel your body. Okay, so that's a pro athlete and that's a ton of food. But take that same idea and let's think about this guy. All right, this is the Flash and the Flash's super, uh, superpower uh, is that he can run allegedly about 10 times the speed of light. Um, the Flash is uh, his uh, secret identity, his alter ego is Barry Allen. Barry Allen, depending on which version of the comic book, was involved in a, a chemical accident and it gave him uh, these superpowers. Okay, but given the fact that with pro athletes, food is fuel, what does Barry Allen need to eat if he's gonna be running at, uh, at those types of speeds? So let's, for Barry Allen, let's scale things back a little bit and let's think about what does he have to eat if he's gonna jog for 30 minutes at the speed of sound, okay? So in order to do that, to calculate what he needs to eat, we need to think about how much oxygen he's gonna to need to get fuel to, to help get fuel to his mu muscles because that's one of the limiting factors. So for that, we need to calculate what is his uh, volume of oxygen, that volume of oxygen that he needs per minute or his VO2. So we'll assume that, you know, the baseline measure for this is going to be uh, 3.5 milliliters of oxygen per minute per kilogram, because that's about what we have for, for most pro athletes. We'll also assume Barry's in pretty good shape, uh, fairly muscular, weighs about 80 kilograms. All right. So to calculate how much he needs per minute, we'll take a speed in meters per minute to get the oxygen he needs per kilogram. That comes out to about... 4,000, okay, when we take the speed in meters per minute, which is about 20,000, then we get, you know, about 4,000 milliliters per kilogram per minute. Okay, then we have to multiply that times his weight to get the oxygen he's gonna need per minute. So somehow he has to be able to exchange about 300 liters of oxygen per minute in order to provide fuel to his muscles. Okay, then given that number, we have to calculate the amount of food that he needs to produce that chemical energy to use that oxygen. That is, we take five calories times that amount, you get about 1600 calories per minute. Okay, 1,600 calories per minute. That's, that's like a large meal that he needs every minute. Now multiply that out times 30 minutes that he needs. Now we're looking at 49,000 calories that he needs to, run, to, to produce the fuel he needs to run for half an hour at the speed of sound. Assuming that a quarter pounder with cheese has about 510 calories, that's 96 McDonald's quarter pounders that he's going to have to eat for breakfast in order to run at that speed, which is quite amount, uh, which is quite a, a lot of food. And it's interesting if you look at some of the more recent uh, DC Universe movies, they they depict a young Barry Allen as always needing the snack and having low blood low blood low blood sugar. Pardon me. So there is a bit of a, a hat tip to the the fact that he would need a tremendous amount of food to uh, to eat. Uh, another example of this is if we imagine Spider-Man. So in depending on which comic book you, you read, so Spider-Man, of course, uh, is famous. He was uh, for being bitten by a radioactive spider as a teenager, and that radioactive spider gave him the power, certain powers and abilities of a spider. So he has super strength, super agility, and in some versions of the book, some versions of the movie, he's able to shoot a web. Now, in some versions, you know, this is technology based that, you know, Peter Parker, the alter ego of Spider-Man is very smart and is able to build these, uh, uh, construct these um, web slingers himself. But in other versions, it's actually biological and he's able to fire the webs out of his hands. Now, again, like the Flash, if he's gonna do this, that protein uh, that's required for that web doesn't just come from anywhere. It has to come from somewhere inside his body. We can assume that it's done through some kind of metabolic process. So assuming that Spider-Man um, 
has to get this from protein, which is one of the main ingredients in, uh, in the webs, and he has to process this protein in order to, to produce this in some way. The question is, how much would he have to eat to be able to shoot a web? Now, there's a very famous scene in the, uh, in the first Spider-Man movie, and this is the one from 18 years ago, uh, where Tobey Maguire paid, played Spider-Man. He has to jump off the side of a building to, uh, to save her, and uh, I'm sorry, she falls off a building, he has to jump off to save her, he fires a web back up onto the building and then he swings to safety. If you look at that scene, you can see that he falls for about seven seconds, which amounts to about 240 meters. And assuming that the web that he shoots is about a millimeter wide, so along the lines of, uh, of piano wire, um, and it's, uh, you can calculate from that size and from you know, the approximate weight of spider web, that's probably about three pounds of web that he's shooting out of his finger. In order to produce that amount of web, uh, the, the 240 meters of web that weighs that three pounds, he'd have to eat about 750 eggs to produce that amount of silk. So again, superheroes, if they existed, they'd be really big eaters. Interesting side note about Spider-Man is um, there are different groups that have been looking into this, into ways to have mammals produce spider silk for a number of years now. I know NASA was looking into this more than 20 years ago. Uh, the idea being that there's a lot of interest in producing spider web because it's extremely strong and it's extremely light and there's not a lot of materials that have those properties. So what they've done is try to look into ways to have mammals produce it. And so that one of the main mammals that they use for doing this is, um, is goats. For doing that. So you could actually, instead of using the um, producing goat's milk from, from the goats, you would actually milk the goat to get spider silk, which is something that still is, uh, is being looked into. All right, staying in the animal community, all right, this is Wolverine. Wolverine, again, is uh, you may have seen him from some of the recent Marvel Universe movies. Wolverine is another mutant, he, meaning he was born with his powers. And he has a number of powers that are very similar to, uh, that have properties of animals. Uh, he has uh, super fast healing uh, powers, so it's, he's very hard to kill because he, uh, he heals almost instantly. He has a um, dog-like uh, sense of smell, and he also has these uh, metal claws that uh, that extend from his forearm. So if he's in, in any kind of a combat situation, he extends the claws out of his hand and he can retract them back in at will. So interesting thing about Wolverine is that these properties exist in the animal world, but less dramatically, they're in a frog. Um, specifically, a animal that's known as the horror frog. And the horror frog uh, actually has the ability to break the bones in its hand when it becomes threatened. And the broken bones then actually extend out of the fingertips very similar to cat claws. And it's able to, uh, um, able to defend itself using those. And there are also, uh, the, it's hypothesized that over time that those, uh, those, those broken bones will heal, they'll retract into the uh, frog's fingertips and it'll be able to uh, actually heal over uh, the flesh of that and be able to uh, function normally again. Very uh, interesting thing about the horror frog is that recently over the summer, there was a movie that came out on Netflix uh, starring Jamie Foxx called Project Power. And the plot behind this movie was that people could eat a pill that would give them uh, some unknown superpower. Um, and one of, the, uh, one of the examples they actually gave for producing the superpower was the ability of the horror frog to, uh, to, put, to extend claws from its fingers. So there was a shout out to the horror frog fairly recently in cinema. All right, next superpower is uh, invisibility. Now this one, for those of you who filled out the survey, you saw this come up once already. And invisibility is definitely one uh, that, comes up, uh, that comes up repeatedly. So uh, right here, this is Sue Storm, the invisible girl from uh, Marvel's Fantastic Four. But of course, there's a number of different superheroes um, who, have this, uh, who are depicted by having this power. You can imagine any one of them on, appearing on this slide. Now there's a number of articles, uh, um, potential speculative scientific articles that talk about how this might be possible. And one of the things, one of the big challenges uh, in invisibility is 
the fact that if you were able to see, that means that light has to actually rest on the back of, uh, of your retina, on the back of your eye, in order for you to be able to see. So that means unless uh, you, if a person who has invisibility is able to see, that means you would be able to see their eyes. So the idea of something that just makes a person completely impervious to light would be very difficult because then you still have to figure out how that person would be able to see with the light falling on the back of their eye. So another idea is that, and one of the ones that's used to explain the comic books is maybe they bend light. Uh, now, if you uh, have studied astrophysics, then you know that one of the most notable re ways of uh, bending light is with a black hole. So certainly if that were feasible, uh, so there are some conversations that would work, but the downside is that Sue Storm would then unfortunately be sucked into her own gravitational field and therefore she could only turn invisible once and she'd have to make it count. Um, another uh, possibility is, is uh, in it, something called inattentional blindness, which is a, uh, a psychological principle that says that it is certainly possible for us to be looking at something directly and not see it. And there are a number of scientific experiments that, uh, that show that this does happen, that we have these inattentional blind spots. Uh, this is something that uh, magicians in part take advantage of in order to use sleight of hand tricks. And there, like I said, there's a number of famous experiments where uh, a psychologist will have you look at a particular action, something completely different will come in front of it, uh, will come in front of the area that you're focused on and you might not actually notice it. So if Sue Storm were able to somehow harness that, uh, that, that psychological principle, then she might be able to walk in front of you without you noticing. The last one, of course, and this is one that, that we know from, from the military and from hunting is camouflage. In camouflage, uh, one of the techniques is that you would actually have something in front of you that looks like the um, whatever the object is behind you. So if you can make the front of you look like the scene behind you, then you would not be able to be seen anymore. Here's a very low tech example of that, uh, of uh, something I lifted off the internet where what this person has done is he has an iPhone or he has a, a mobile phone that has a camera that's looking behind him, that's looking at the scene behind him. And he has a tablet that's inserted into the hole in the front of his shirt there. And so the tablet is showing a, an image of what's behind him through the camera. And this is something that, uh, that, many, that uh, scientists in the military have been working on probably for about 25 years or so. Uh, actually, it's uh, supposedly inspired by the movie Predator, if anybody's seen that with the cloaking device that the Predator had in that movie. And the idea of the way they would do this is it would actually be multiple cameras that would be uh, aimed in a number of different directions on one side of something large, like a, um, like a battleship. And on the other side, there would be multiple screens showing those multiple images that in a sense would allow the um, uh, the transport to be completely cloaked uh, as a result of those. So that is something that, uh, that's been worked on for a number of years uh, technologically. All right, and speaking of invisibility, thank you to everyone for responding to the poll leading up to this. Um, these are the results uh, of what we had. Um, you can see that we had about 76% of you uh, we're interested in the superpower of flight and 24% uh, in invisibility. And, and for those of you who, uh, who don't know what I'm talking about, so I provided a survey in advance of this presentation and I just asked the question, which, super which superpower would you rather have, invisibility or flight? Um, to give full credit, this is not my idea. Um, this was actually done um, in a 2001 episode of This American Life. And what I like to do here is just to re reproduce the, uh, the same uh, survey that they did back then, just to see how maybe um, ideas would have changed over time and to see if maybe the, the groups that come to these presentations might have different opinions. So uh, this was something that was done by John Hodgman uh, just to investigate you know, what, what the differences would be. Um, what we find is uh, that your answers were actually very similar to, uh, to some of the other surveys that are out there. So we got 76% in favor of flight and about 24% uh, in favor of invisibility. Well, not long after the This American Life episode, uh, Forbes, uh, the magazine, reached out to about 7,000 people uh, and asked the same question. Their result was 72% flight and 28% invisibility. So not that different from, from what we're seeing here. 
and the responses that we get, the reasons why, um, which is one of the other questions that I asked in the survey, also tend to be very similar uh, when you ask people. So flight very often is about travel. It's about being able to go to different places and it's about the access. We also find when you look at the reasons, flight people are often down on invisibility. So meaning you pick flight because you don't, because you think invisibility is creepy or you think invisibility is disturbing in some way. Invisibility in contrast uh, is often about privacy um, and, wanting to, uh, and wanting to be secretive. Uh, that's often the reason that's given. And those are reasons that were also uh, given within this survey. But what's interesting about uh, the responses also is that nobody wants to be a superhero. Nobody looks at these things that are described as superpowers and says, oh yeah, I wanna do this to fight crime. Now, a couple of you, uh, which was definitely very interesting, do want to use your powers to help people. So I actually had responses from, there were people who wanted to use flight to help people and also uh, a, a, somebody who said that they wanted to use invisibility to help people. So that was definitely being brought up in a positive light, but nobody actually said that they wanna do this to, uh, to fight crime. So um, again, the, there's really not any analysis here. It doesn't mean anything uh, if you choose flight or invisibility. It doesn't say anything about your personality at all. It's just, uh, it's just an interesting thing, uh, interesting thing to do. And at the end of the presentation, I'll provide the link to the This American Life episode, uh, which I highly recommend. All right, the other thing that I asked in the survey is, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? Um, this is, a, uh, this is a word cloud that shows like what some of the most common responses were. Uh, this group is particularly fond of, uh, fond of flight. Um, another thing that came up uh, quite a bit was time manipulation or time travel. Uh, teleportation was a big one. And then one that was a little bit new to me this year was reality manipulation. So there were multiple people who said that they wanted to, uh, they wanted to warp reality uh, with their superpower. Again, same kind of result here. Not really anybody who, uh, who was interested in becoming a superhero. There were a variety of, uh, of very interesting reasons for doing this, but, but again, not, uh, not really uh, a lot of interest in, in using your superpowers for good. Um, oh yeah, also I have to say, uh, there was one person who, who wanted, to, uh, wanted immunity or the ability to cure uh, the coronavirus. So there was definitely, a would have been a huge benefit in, in that person getting their superpower as well. All right, but this is an area of you know personality uh, psychology and uh, and counseling that I'm not as not very familiar with. So I'm going to go into an area that I know a bit more about. Okay, so this is the cockpit to a F-16 uh, fighter. Um, this is one of the most complicated displays and control arrays uh, that you can think of in, in, in different systems. And in human factors, that's one of the things that I as a researcher work with, uh, work with quite a bit. So uh, for those of you who may not already be familiar with that field, the human factors, we do a combination, we work with a combination of engineering and psychology to design complex systems and complex interfaces that work well within uh, human uh, limitations and strengths. And the cockpit of a fighter jet is one of the more fascinating things because here you have a extremely complex device with a number with many, many different displays that under most circumstances would be completely overwhelming. You know, so you're reading information off of a display at the same time that you're flying above the speed of sound, which is a lot to ask of any human being. So on the F-16 in particular, there are 115 different displays uh, that a person could be keeping track of. And that's for things like navigation, weapon systems, uh, current stat system statuses, warnings, communications, all on a platform that's intentionally unstable so it can be more maneuverable. So the pilot always has to be paying attention to, uh, to what's going on. It's both demanding physically uh, and mentally. It also requires years of training to be able to do, and that is years of training of a fairly elite uh, type of pilot. So once you actually get accepted to even start the process to, to learn how to be a, uh, a fighter pilot, only about three people out of a thousand become, become fighter pilots. So we're talking of a very, very small number of people who are able to do this. So again, can't emphasize enough, this is known to be an overwhelming interface. So how could we possibly control something even more complicated than that? Which brings me to Iron Man. 
So Iron Man takes all those things that we saw uh, within a fighter plane and then builds them into through a combining a, uh, a technology called haptics, puts them into a suit that a person wears and is able to perform very similar uh, sets of functions. Um, Iron Man is, uh, the Iron Man suit was created and is worn by Tony Stark, uh, the playboy billionaire who is uh, mostly his superpower is that he's extremely smart, but also uh, he is the second richest superhero in the, uh, in the Marvel Universe. I'll tell you who the first one is a little bit later on. Okay, so a couple of things about the Iron Man suit. It is a very versatile, uh, it's a very versatile platform. Um, it allows uh, Iron Man to operate uh, pretty much at, at a human level. You can see here that the suit can, can walk normally and has normal posture as a human being, but also at the same time uh, has the additional mobility of being able to fly at, uh, at supersonic speeds uh, uh, when needed. Okay, so what I want to talk about with Iron Man is there are a number of different uh, research areas right now that are investigating different aspects of the armor that would that would bring it to that would actually make some of these things possible. Um, but so right now this technology doesn't exist, but it is something that's being worked on. So in reality, these types of suits are called exoskeletons or exosuits. Um, they're used and being investigated for military, industrial, uh, athletic, and some rehabilitation settings. So in any place where you need to bring uh, additional strength and or endurance to the individual that's wearing them, that's what they're uh, being used for. But right now, these are still kind of prototype systems. Um, we have a long way to go before even some of the more basic functions like walking are, are, gonna, be, are gonna be possible. Um, the biggest hurdle to them right now, or one of the biggest hurdles, is user acceptance. They're very hard to use. Um, so one of the reasons, uh, so looking at uh, Iron Man here, is that is, is how do you size these things? So for example, if you take a suit that's actually connected in a way that would give a person additional strength, um, you have to consider how it shifts when you outstretch your arms or bring them back in again. So if you designed a suit to fit when somebody's arms were completely outstretched, as soon as you brought your hands in again, you'd actually jam your fingers uh, into the glove portion. Now if you did, or sorry, the opposite, your, your, your gloves would actually extend beyond your fingers. But if you did the opposite and you sized it so it would actually fit when it's close to your body, when you extended your arms out again, then you would actually squeeze your fingers into your gloves. And if you look at uh, the spacesuits um, that astronauts use for, for conducting their missions, one of the ways they get around this is that they actually constrain the number of movements they make to a, uh, to a smaller number of, of movements. And these things require a certain amount of training. So that's one of the more simple things is that just sizing it would be, uh, very, would be very difficult. Um, the other thing that you run into, and this is a bit more, uh, this is a bit more academic is the way that you actually control the suit. So the suit is powered. It provides super strength and super um, endurance to the wearer. But there are no, But when you do this, you're actually having to operate through what's called a haptic interface. And a haptic interface is a, um, is a type of a control that actually uses your sense of touch and your sense of movement to be able to interact with a particular system. Um, we have a number of senses that we use whenever we interact with something physically that we don't even think of anymore because we've spent a lifetime evolving to be able to use those. Uh, anytime we uh, interact with something through our sense of touch, there is, uh, the senses are called somatosensory. So there's your sense of touch, there's pressure, there's temperature. There's also something called proprioception, which are nerves that are within your muscles and your tendons that give you an idea of where your, uh, where your body is uh, within space. It's what allows us uh, to have certain performance and allows us to have dexterity. Now, if you're wearing a powered suit, you're actually interrupting a lot of those signals and it becomes a lot more, uh, a lot more difficult to understand exactly where your, body, where your body is in space. So as I mentioned, we've developed a lot of skill-based behaviors over time by operating you know, immediately within our environment. But as soon as you just, and you, that we do without thinking, just like walking, 
which is actually a lot more difficult uh, from a kinematic sense than, than, than you might imagine. So it requires proprioception, it allow, requires balance, or it requires you know, having a sense of touch on the bottoms of your feet, all of which are gonna be interrupted if you're wearing a powered bodysuit, which is actually doing these things for you. Um, one of the issues that they run into and one of the reasons why uh, people don't like using these is because they're powered suits. Essentially imagine that moving the suit with your muscles is what powers it. It's what gives it a command for the suit to respond with some kind of electric output and move a limb. There is a small delay in that. And the result is that it feels like you're walking through mud and people tend to get really fatigued when they wear these suits. And so that's one of the things that people are still working on. Okay, so in summary, just moving around in a suit can be cognitively demanding because you're fighting against your own natural impulses. But on top of that, let's load up all these weapon systems. So the Iron Man armor, depending on which one you look at, can have any number of different weapons that are included. So here he's got his repulsor cannon in his right hand. He's got these different varieties of beams and missiles that are popping up uh, all over the, the armor. And I would ask if you, Imagine how this would work in a fighter aircraft where the pilot would actually have access to these through buttons on the, on the, uh, on the flight deck or on the dash or uh, within a flight stick. How then is he turning all of these things on at once? One of the answers to this that they give uh, within the comic books is that this is done through artificial intelligence. And in the Iron Man comic book, this is done, or sorry, in the movie, this is done through Jarvis, uh, which stands for just a very, uh, just a rather very intelligent system. Uh, Jarvis is Tony Stark's uh, assistant within his company, within his home, but also within the suit. Um, talking about artificial intelligence is a bit out of the scope of this particular talk, but the idea here is that the computer system would somehow be able to intuit what he wants to do or be able to interpret certain uh, less complex actions and then be able to act accordingly. So the answer here is that this would be artificial intelligence. And this is certainly something that, uh, that people are working on now using this additional machine intelligence to be able to perform these functions. This is uh, machine intelligence is, or artificial intelligence is uh, one of the technology, technologies behind things like driverless cars, uh, between uh, um, interpreting uh, the results of um, certain medical tests and making other complex decisions on the part of humans in those types of environments. So that would be one of the options here is to be able to extend the powers of the suit through some kind of artificial intelligence technology, which is certainly a topic within a lot of um, computer science departments in different universities. All right, the last thing that is interesting about Iron Man that has that requires a lot of additional inquiry is his ability to perform certain movements across a scale that humans can't do. More, so what I mean by this is, so in this scene right here, um, Iron Man's had a hard day and so he's eating a donut. So he's able to use this suit, which has you know tremendous crushing power to hold a donut without destroying it. He could do the same thing with an egg. He could do the same thing by patting somebody on the shoulder without hurting them. So he is able to perform normal human movements uh, with the suit. So then you can also do this. So what you're doing here is you're going well beyond the ability of, uh, of what uh, a human being can actually lift and, and press. So the Hulk probably weighs a couple of tons. That's the other superhero in this. And he's lifting up the Hulk with a strength and pounding him into the pavement. And that's through the same control array that he's using for holding a donut. So somewhere within the armor, he has to be able to communicate somewhere between human function and superhuman strength without damaging uh, the things that require normal human strength. And here's an example of that from the, uh, from the comic book. Here's a section where in one scene, he's using his armor to lift a freighter uh, out of the water and up onto land so it doesn't crush a bunch of people standing by and he flies with the suit and punches somebody on the face without separating his, uh, his neck from his body. So again, something within that control, that gain function, he would have to be able to adjust from a human uh, ability to a superhuman ability. And so far, we have a number of systems that can do one or the other, but doing both and communicating that accurately and safely to the pilot, that's something that would be a lot more challenging.
And this comes up in particular in the concept of robotic surgery. So using some kind of additional computer aid to perform surgery um, uh, while actually still having that proper feel that a surgeon needs to, uh, to do to make accurate cuts. All right. So this is an example of what one of those bodysuits actually looks like uh, right now. This is the Sarcos Guardian uh, XO. Sarcos has been making uh, Guardian uh, XO suits for quite a, quite a while now. This is something that's used uh, in manufacturing and construction and warehouse settings. So again, anytime somebody needs additional uh, strength and endurance to perform a task uh, and also to prevent repetitive stress injuries, uh, this, is, this is the type of suit they would use. Um, and it can be yours for the low price of about $100,000. All right. So remaining in the, uh, in the domain of the possible, um, we've got Daredevil. When I was a kid, Daredevil was one of my, was one of my favorite superheroes. Uh, and his superpower uh, is, so when he, was, uh, when he was a student, he was involved uh, in an accident, uh, as many of these are, uh, where a chemical spill took away his sight. Uh, so Daredevil is, uh, is vision impaired, he's completely blind. Uh, but as what happens with you know, some people who have uh, these different abilities is that it, it enhanced his other senses. So Daredevil is able to function as if he had sight and in some cases as if he had enhanced sight through uh, his sense of touch and through his sense of hearing. And so Daredevil navigates in his environment through echolocation. He can hear sounds much in the way that bats and dolphins do of sounds echoing off nearby uh, items. And he's able to figure out where he is in space, how close those items are and what they, and, and what they are. So there is an example of this in real life. So this is Daniel Kish. Uh, Daniel Kish, um, lost his sight when he was very young, but over the years, um, he has developed the ability to use vocal clicks to navigate uh, through echolocation. Uh, the way he describes it, he's able to make out very, not necessarily to make out specific shapes, but he can recognize objects. So for example, a wall would have different uh, echo characteristics than a tree, which is composed of leaves. So he's actually created an organization called World Access for the Blind, and he teaches people how to use, echo, or teaches people who are vision impaired how to echolocate in, uh, in real life. Uh, he's been nicknamed the real Batman, uh, and he has a fascinating TED Talk, uh, which was uh, how I got the information for, for this particular presentation, which I, I highly recommend. His, his story is inspiring. All right, another example of a real world of a superhero in the real world is uh, Dean Karnazes, who is a ultra marathoner and was nicknamed by Guardian magazine, the man who can run forever. Um, so if, if you've ever run, uh, ever jogged or even walked for a great distance or you know, performed exercise for an extended period of time, you're probably gonna experience you know, burning muscles, heart pounding, you're gonna be gasping for air. That, those are signs that you've reached your lactate threshold. So when we exercise, uh, we break down glucose for energy. Um, this is the flip side of what I was talking about with the flash. Lactate is the byproduct of that, of that process. It's converted back into energy, but eventually this being a cycle, your body can't keep up with it anymore. So it can't, it can't convert it as fast as it's produced. There's a buildup and then your body tells you when to stop by producing these uh, different aches and pains. Dean doesn't get those signals. So according to him, to his assessment, um, he's never had a muscle burn, he's never had a cramp, and no matter how hard he pushes, his muscles never seize up. Some of his examples of feats that he's done as a result, uh, one of his records is that he ran 50 marathons in 50 states in 50 days. So a marathon a day for 50 days. And on day 50, his very last marathon, he was still able to run the marathon in less than three hours. Uh, he also once ran 350 miles straight by running nonstop for just over 80 hours. So this is an example of somebody through uh, a combination of training, really good genetics, um, and excellent fitness, he's able to overcome one of the main things that the rest of us, uh, prevent the rest of us from, uh, from performing. All right, so from the physical world, we can go into the academic world. So these six people, these are famous scientists 
uh, within the Marvel universe. Um, each one of them has uh, an, one or more advanced degrees, uh, ranging from um, the Incredible Hulk here, who is uh, his alter ego is, uh, is Dr. Banner, who according to the movies has, uh, has seven PhDs. And uh, ranging on the other side of the scale, here you have Dr. Doom, who uh, actually quit his PhD program because he feel it didn't he didn't have anything to offer. Uh, and interestingly, he's one of the only heroes or villains here who refers to himself as doctor, even though you know, te technically he hasn't really earned that. Um, quick digression from this one: uh, all of these all these superheroes and, and villains have science degrees. I have to uh, give a little shout out to to uh, T'Challa, the Black Panther. Um, who is, uh, who is not only a king, but he also, uh, in some versions of the comic book, he has five PhDs uh, and not just in the sciences. So T'Challa's degrees are in engineering, economics, uh, physics, political science, uh, and psychology. So I have to give him credit. Uh, one of the, probably my favorite academic within the Marvel universe, just because you know he's much more well-rounded uh, than, than some of the others. Also, as I mentioned uh, before, T'Challa is the richest superhero in the Marvel Universe. All right, going back to these folks. Um, one thing that's interesting about uh, every one of these um, superheroes and supervillains is that all of them got their powers as a result of self-experimentation. So certainly the whether or not self, uh, the ethics of self-experimentation uh, is certainly something that is, uh, that could be a separate discussion, but that is something that, uh, that's how, where their powers came from is that they created some technology, created some kind of a, a chemical response, uh, and then received some superpower as a result of that. So that is also something that has happened in the real world. So this is Dr. Barry Marshall, uh, also known as the guinea pig doctor. Um, when he was an internist uh, back in 1981, um, it was estimated that about 10% of adults suffered from some kind of ulcer. And at the time, uh, mainstream science said that ulcers were caused by stress. That's just where the conventional wisdom of, of, the, of the time was. So if you don't know what an ulcer is, an ulcer is a sore within your stomach lining that lets acid through. It's extremely painful. And if left untreated, uh, it can actually lead to stomach cancer, which again, at the time was, uh, was, very, uh, was very common and something that uh, the Barry Marshall was very um, interested in. So at the time, um, Barry Marshall actually thought there was a simple treatment and not necessarily required um, addressing the, the stress aspect of it. He thought that due to uh, some work he'd done biopsying uh, ulcers that was actually caused by a bacterial infection. But uh, he was unsuccessful in convincing people of, of his theory. And he was also unsuccessful in trying to do animal experiments uh, to, to learn more about it because as it turns out that this is a particular type of bacteria that doesn't really affect uh, animals unless they're primates. So he wasn't able to prove his theory and he wasn't able to move on into human subjects uh, testing. So he did what any super scientist would do. He actually removed some of the bacteria from a patient who was suffering from ulcers, who he was treating. He created himself a, uh, a little cocktail with this bacterium and he drank it. So within five days, he started throwing up violently. Within 10 days, uh, he was suffering from inflammation and gastritis, which is a precursor to ul ulcers, thereby showing that yes, very likely this was due to uh, bacterium and not something else. He ended up taking a specially uh, mixed uh, cocktail of antibiotics uh, and he cured himself. And then after some work, uh, he spread the word. Uh, people did uh, buy into his, uh, his results. And then actually a number of years later in 2005, he shared a Nobel prize for his work. So now, you know, ulcers are a lot more rare uh, and uh, the, this particular type of bacterium that causes this type of ulcer has been nearly eradicated. All right, saving one of my favorites here. Uh, this is another, uh, another scientist who performed self-experimentation. This is uh, Dr. John Stapp, uh, known as the fastest man on earth uh, from Time Magazine. Um, so in 1954, he became famous uh, for setting a land speed record. Uh, John Stapp uh, went into a jet powered rocket on rails and uh, set a record by traveling over 600 miles an hour. 
Um, but what's interesting, and the reason why I bring him up is not because of the speed that he set, it was by the fact that he decelerated from over 600 miles an hour to a complete stop in less than one and a half seconds. Um, so what I like about uh, Stapp also is that he is one of the, um, he's one of the, the creators, or sorry, one of the first people to work in a field called aviation me medicine or aerospace medicine, which is one of the precursors to human factors, the field that I would go into a number of years later. So basically John Stapp made it possible for people like me to study aviation and to study uh, driverless cars. So his research program in particular at the time was to study the effects, uh, the, the, the human body's ability to withstand intensive G-forces during acceleration. And the idea was to better protect pilots during a crash. Now at the time the conventional wisdom was that a, there was no reason to design uh, seat belts or any type of a crash mechanism that would operate beyond 18 Gs because it was thought that the human body could only survive um, that level, couldn't survive any more than 18 Gs. So he actually went to prove otherwise because he believed that pilots were actually walking away from worse crashes than that in some, in some circumstances. So over a three year period, uh, John Stapp subjected himself to 29 runs on this rocket sled and 29 stops. And over that time period, he cracked ribs, he lost fillings, uh, he broke his collarbone, he got concussions. Uh, suffered a broken wrist twice, which because he was a medical doctor, he actually said himself, but he showed conclusively that the, uh, that stops above 18 Gs are survivable. And what's actually killing the pilots was not the deceleration above 18 Gs. It was actually the crushing of the, uh, of the, of the cockpit and the airplane around them that was killing them. So actually he made a, a number of different stops, but in the one where he went 600 miles an hour and then stopped in 1.4 seconds, he actually subjected himself to 46 Gs or the equivalent of being crushed by four tons of force. So the other thing that happened with his research is it led to the design of better and better seat belts. And so uh, before seat belts were actually mandatory within vehicles, he worked with automotive manufacturers and hosted a research conference, which still bears his name, and he used this research to design seatbelts that were much more, um, much stronger in, in the event of a uh, automobile crash. All right. So what I wanna say is if you go back and look at people like this and look at anyone who's studying uh, the sciences, despite the fact that they don't have true superpowers, su true superpowers, they have a lot to contribute to society. Uh, and this is summarized very well in the cartoon um, abstruse goose, where you have here um, a science man right here is applying to be in this league of superheroes. Uh, they want to know what his qualifications are, and they want to know if he has any cool powers. And the response back to that is, over the years, scientists have mastered winged flight. They've landed on the moon. They've invented penicillin, and they've practically eradicated smallpox and polio vaccines. And at this point, have saved millions of lives, and we can expect to save billions of lives uh, over the course of over the course of the future. So, in effect, you know, scientific inquiry is giving us superpowers already, and is going to continue to do so. And so, for those of you who are in any even partially related field, partially related to science, uh, please keep going because uh, you're making tremendous impacts, and uh, I look forward to seeing what uh, what discoveries you make. So here are, in, uh, at the end here, I'll, and I'll start looking at the questions here in just a second. I do want to give full credit to my references. Um, the first couple of uh, things that I said about um, the Flash and about uh, Spider-Man and what they eat for breakfast, this, this comes from a, uh, an essay called The Breakfast of Superheroes, which appears in a book, The Secret Science of Superheroes, which got, uh, came out uh, through the Royal Society of Chemistry. Um, the This American Life episode that I got the invisibility and flight questions from was episode 178. And then some of the other uh, references that I used for, um, for the different other aspects that I showed here are, are listed as well. And if you have any other questions, you can feel free to reach out uh, to me later. My email is there uh, at the bottom of the screen, climate at hsrc.unc.edu. Um, so I will go ahead and I'll look at questions. So 
Uh, I'll go ahead and start looking at these now. Bear with me while I while I read them. Um, all right, first question that came up, do superheroes only fight crime? Um, that is a good question. Um, and unfortunately, I don't know enough about comic book lore to be able to give you a good answer uh, on that one. I wish I could come up with other examples, but uh, I guess this is a callback to the uh, to the survey and what they do with those uh, other powers. The, actually, now that I can think of, I, so I read some of these uh, when, I, when I was a tween, and I know there was one superhero named Dazzler who actually used her powers to, uh, to perform light shows. So she had the a superpower of, of being able to produce light from her fingers, and she used her powers uh, for entertainment. So she was, a, uh, she was a singer, and she would use those for her stage show. So that's at least one example. I would assume that there are, there are other. Um, all right, another person has a question about nanotechnology. Um, is nanotechnology possible? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and this is a huge area of inquiry within the field of mechanical engineering. Um, it is not my field, so I, I couldn't speak to it uh, intelligently. I know nanotechnology is something that's referred to in the Marvel Universe as one of the, the ways that um, Tony Stark stores his Iron Man armor. Um, nanotechnology, yes. I'll just say it's possible, yes. It is definitely a field of inquiry, but that's about as far as I can go to it. All right, how well can a human switch their proprioception between their own body and an exoskeleton? Do you think we can learn to switch between modes and recalibrate? It makes me think of science fiction books I've read where spacers that were used to, to low gravity or spacesuits end up being really clumsy when they're back in traditional gravity. That is a great question. Uh, and I'm glad you asked it because I was actually just talking to some people about this over lunch. Um, so you saw in that, uh, if you saw that video of, uh, of, of Iron Man, Tony Stark um, it lands on the roof of his, of his building and then walks down a flight of stairs while robots come and remove the pieces of armor from his body. And I love this scene because if you've ever gone roller skating, if you've ever gone skiing or snowboarding and you've had to wear something heavy on your feet for an extended period of time, your body eventually habituates to that behavior and accommodates the amount of strength that it's, uh, that uh, strength output in order to use those. So you start walking funny when you take off roller skates or you take off skis or snowboard boots. And I would imagine that if Iron Man was out flying all day or walking around all day in his suit and uh, suddenly had to land, he wouldn't gracefully walk down those stairs. He'd probably stumble at least a little bit. So I think as with most, most things, the body eventually acclimates to uh, it, it senses around performing a particular function and requires a little bit of downtime. So I think that once you took the suit off, there'd be, there'd be a bit of an adjustment period before the person was able to, to act normally. Now, whether or not that could actually happen while the suit was being worn, I'm not sure. That would be something interesting to look into. All right, so uh, I have another question here. So uh, this is referring to, um, to, to Dean Karnazes. So he doesn't get signals when he runs. If he runs too much, could that hurt him? Yes, yes, he could definitely get blisters the same way the rest of us do. The only thing that is different for Dean is that he very efficiently is able to, to process uh, the lactate, uh, that his process is just faster than the rest of ours. So if it doesn't involve that particular process, yes, he can certainly have muscle strains and sprains the way the rest of us would. But the main limit in fact, limiting factor, according to him, is you know, that he just gets physically tired. All right. Um, <laughs> there's another comment um, that you all may have seen. Superheroes also save the world. That is true. Superheroes definitely do save the world, and we're very grateful uh, to them for that one. <laughs> um, yeah, OK, so yeah, right. Thank you for uh, for pointing out sea legs. I don't have a lot of boating experience, but yeah, that's ex it's the exact same thing. Uh, it's it's the same it's the same process. So, okay, um, we're actually coming to the end of our time uh, at this point as well. So, um, if there are any last minute questions to uh, to add in the chat, I would be happy to respond to them. Like I said, um, I also. Um, uh, feel free to uh, to email me at uh, kalaman at hsrc.unc.edu. Uh, but again, I do want to thank you all for uh, for attending UNC Research Week, uh, and thank you very much for attending uh, this 
particular uh, talk. It's always fun for me to be able to step out of my own research area for a little while and do something that's a little bit more fun, especially now when we could use a little bit of a break from reality. So if there are no more questions, Jennifer, do you have anything? I'm good. Yeah, my, my tech issues are over. Um, thank you all, everybody, for joining. And um, sometime within the next um, few weeks, we're going to have this put this recording out in case you want to share it to, um, with anyone else. So thanks a lot. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a good rest of the day.